But let me go ahead and read 1 John 5, 4. Kind of set the stage. Actually, we'll read verses 1 through uh, 5. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. And that means if you love God, you love his son. There's no way around. You can't say, well, I love God, but I hate Jesus. No, it don't work that way. Amen. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Amen. Now let me say, there's a lot of statements and a lot of things being said today about there's no commandments and commandments are the work of the flesh. And it's amazing how many times the New Testament tells us to keep his commandments. And well, there's only one commandment, the commandment of love. In the context of when that was said, they referred to that. But you go through and read, read the writings, there's more, than, the, the, there's more than one commandment in the Bible. Amen? Now, Jesus said that the, love, the commandment of love, on all the law and the prophets hinge that law as the law of love. In other words, everything has to be done from love. But it is not the only commandment. <clears throat> and we don't have time to go through a list of this morning, but I can, and I can guarantee you, if you read your New Testament epistles, you'll find more than one commandment. Amen. All right. Well, we're not there this morning. Uh, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Thank God for his word. Thank God for the revelation that comes out of the word. Thank God for the Holy Ghost, the teacher. Uh, of the word to the church, amen. Now, that doesn't mean you don't need Bible teachers. Some people take that scripture, you know, uh, you, know you have an unction from the Holy Wind and have no need that any man teach you. Well, uh, you got to take everything in context and do some study. It does, if, if no man was to teach you, then he wouldn't put teachers in the church if that meant no man is supposed to teach. It means something other than, you know, it has a different meaning, and it means that we're to be taught by the anointing, but that anointing will teach through vessels that are, that are called of God to teach. They're not teaching out of the flesh, they're teaching out of the spirit. That's what, it doesn't mean, well, I don't need anybody, you know, people, read, see, you've got to be a better Bible student than some people. Amen? Amen? You've got to study the Bible, you've got to be a better student of the Bible. And, that's, and that, that's the kind of a thing we're hitting on right now. We need to be good Bible stu students. Amen. We need to be good stu stu uh, studious of the Bible, good and studious of the Bible. <clears throat> Somebody come along and take one scripture, run out and build a whole narrative on it and, and mess all kinds of people up. We don't believe in church. In, first, in the early church, they didn't have churches. Yes, they did. Paul talked about the church in their house. There were, there were churches, you know. <clears throat> and when he wrote the letter, when John wrote the letters by the Holy Ghost to the seven churches, <laughs> hello, they did have churches in the early church. You know, the seven, uh, to, the, to, the start, to the candle of the church at Eph uh, Ephesus, and to the church of Thessalonica. So there were churches. See, people just, just take little things and run off with them and mess all kinds of people up. Uh, number, number one, uh, be a good Bible student. Number two, don't follow the blind. What do you mean? The young and the dumb. They might have a lot of zeal, but until they're ready and prepared, don't follow after them. Amen? Because y'all are both, both in the same boat. Now, all right. So that was just all a little for free. Now, this morning we're going, we're going to get into 1 John 5, 4. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Now, in our circles, we have put so much emphasis on the, on the arena of faith of believing and receiving. The prayer of faith, or the prayer of believing and receiving. In other words, I believe that I receive according to such and such scripture in its mind. And, and, and honestly, we've done that so much, I think some people think that, that is all faith is. And we've lost out on something, and I believe we've lost out on a key. Now understand, to whom the revelation of the prayer of believing and receiving came to. It came to a generation of people who, who trusted God. Even in, even in darkness, they would trust God. They would trust God to their own destiny. In other words, if they were in a tough situation, they would just say, I'm going to trust God. Okay. And then a revelation came that you could speak the word and receive the word and believe the word. Now, we've moved past that one or even two generations, and now we've got people just coming in and thinking the faith is only, you know, speaking the word and getting something from God. And we've lost the revelation of not just the prayer of believing and receiving. We've, we, we, we have lost the revelation of having a reliance, a confidence, an adherence, and a trust in God. 
And see, the, the ability to pray and believe and receive is founded in a wholehearted trust in the one who should be the object of our faith. All right. So, <clears throat> I'm going to read to you out of the uh, complete biblical library. It is out of print now, uh, but there's an electronic version uh, that's been, that has been published. Um, and so, uh, you know, I have it on my computer. I, do, I actually do have the volumes in, in print in my office, and uh, they're, they're, uh, they're awesome. And I'm glad they put them in print in, in electronic. Electro I mean, we waited for 10 years to get it that way. We're so excited to have it that way. But uh, this, book, this, this series is out of print in, in paper. All right? But reading from the word Pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, uh, out of the complete biblical library, there, there are different classifications of the use of the word, starting typically with classical Greek. In other words, they will trace this word from its classical Greek US usage into the Septuagint usage. In other words, comparing it to the Hebrew words that it was used to translate in the Greek, giving meaning, and then going into actually to the, the, the New Testament usage. And in, in this case, there's an intertestamental usage, that is, between the Old and New Covenants. I may not read that part, but I may. Y'all ready? Put your, put your listening shoes on. There's a lot to read. Faith is one of the most crucial terms in the entire Bible. The Greek term pistis is the, is, am I pronouncing that right, Bill? Uh, Bill? Pistis. Pistis. I left out the T. Pistis. The Greek term pistis is the chief conveyor of this concept in the New Testament. Classical writers, that means pre-Bible usage. Okay? Classical writers understood pistis in a variety of ways. It denotes the trust one has in another, but it also may indicate the trustworthiness, reliability of someone. Pistis acquired social and religious overtones at a very early stage. During the Hellenistic period, pistis was used to describe faith in the existence of gods or as over against atheism. Uh, the ultimate goal in the mystery, in the mystery religions was uh, pistis, faith, in the deities that they were being proclaimed. So, in other words, they began to use it as a relationship to deities. Okay? The Septuagint usage, in other words, the Greek translation of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Chaldean and Hebrew Old Covenant. Primarily in, in uh, Hebrew, some Chaldean, and uh, I believe even some Aramaic. Okay? But the, the, these are the, primarily Hebrew. And so this is, this is the word that was used to translate certain Hebrew words. The Septuagint indicates that the Greek term pistis especially corresponds to the Hebrew term imana, which meant fidelity and faithfulness. The related verb amen, or aman, describes a faithful attitude toward another human being. It is especially used to denote a relationship with God. It also indicates a trust in God with respect to his word and his promises and obedience to his commands. And you see, you just can't get away from it, can you? Amen? The many dimensions of faith are also expressed by the Hebrew betak. That means to rely on, to put confidence in. That's one of the areas I want to major on. To rely on God, to put your confidence in God. I believe there's a lot of stuff that we're doing uh, in, in speaking the word and making the declaration of our scriptures, which we should be doing, which is a biblical practice and a biblical process. But it needs to be founded first in a reliance and a confidence in the author of those words you're confessing in God. He has to be the object of your faith. We can have the faith of God, but we also need to have faith in God. In order to really be able to use and exercise the faith of God, what things shall ever use are when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. You have to first have faith in a trust, a confidence, and a reliance in God. Does that make sense? In other words, without being fully trusting and fully persuaded and fully confident of the God in whom you're serving and the God that whom you love, you will not be able to use the faith of his faith to get things, or to get things done. It has to be a confidence in him. In other words, he'll do what he said he would do. But that only comes from having faith in him. I honestly believe that we have a whole generation of people, a lot of people in this new generation, who are trying to exercise the faith of God with no faith in God. And we've got to get to a faith in God. Now, Job, 
Job didn't quite have it scripturally right, but I understand his heart. And I think we need to get his heart. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Yet will I put my confidence in him. In other words, he, he fully knew. He fully was persuaded that if he put his confidence in God, no matter what was going on, even if he slayed him, it was going to be for, it was going to be for his good. Now we understand that there was, a, there, was a, there was a theological error there because God wasn't doing it to him, but the fact that he was going to put his trust in God no matter what was a demonstration, amen, of his faith in God. He trusted his God. Just like Abraham. Being fully persuaded that what he was promised able to perform. Remember, he told, he told him, I and the lad go yonder and return. See, we get that as a faith confession. But I'm telling you, that faith confession came out of the fact he had a confidence and a trust in his God. That even if he slew Isaac, he would have to raise him from the dead because he knew him and he knew he couldn't lie. And he knew he said, in Isaac shall your seed be. It wasn't just that he, he trusted his word. He trusted his God. He had faith in, everybody say in. In God. He had a trust. He had a reliance. He had a confidence in his God. Y'all hear you with me? I'm here with me. All right. So the Hebrew, so in the Septuagint, now the, the word pistis was used to translate numerous or, or several Hebrew words with this word pistis. Here it used batak, which we said to rely on, but confidence in, as well as the verb uh, chase, that is, it means to seek refuge in. <clears throat> sometimes I think we're putting more confidence in our confession and our ability to exercise faith than we are putting a trust and a reliance in the God who is the author of the words we're confessing. Amen. Now, I'm not trying to run from one ditch to the other. I'm not, doing away with I'm not saying don't confess. I'm not saying don't speak the word. I'm not saying don't have confessions. But let's build them on the right thing. Let's build them on something that has a foundation other than you. Now, I, I, a preacher a number of years ago said this. I heard him say it. It wasn't like I'm just making this up. I heard it. Here's it. I heard him say this. He said, he said, if Jesus wasn't real, if God wasn't real, if the Bible wasn't real, he said, I'd still live this way because it works. See, see, that's, see if you, when you remove God from your faith, you don't have any faith. Not the faith the Bible talks about. Because our confession is rooted and grounded in our confidence, reliance, and trust of the one who spoke the word and gave us the word to speak. I am going to harp on this until we all get it. I'm going to come at it from every angle I can come at it from until we get it. I don't want to leave anybody undone. Amen? Hallelujah. And so here... We move along, uh, as well as the verb uh, chesa, to seek refuge in. In both cases, God is often the object in whom trust and confidence and refuge is placed or sought. Faith is not a passive resignation to life like fate. Well, whatever will be, will be. That's, that's you know, we, faith is not que sera, sera. Doris Day, you might like that movie, but Doris Day's uh, view on life and her worldview is unscriptural. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. That's not Bible. And that's not faith. It is not a fatalistic resignation. All right? It's not passive and going, oh, well, you know, uh, whatever. Pulling the Eeyore on us. How many ever watched Eeyore with Winnie the Pooh? All right. <clears throat> Rather, so faith is not a passive resignation to life like faith is. Rather, it is a confidence that God will fulfill his promises and will carry out his salvation plan just as it is expressed in the covenant relationship. Amen. The prophets likewise preach faith on the true basis of life for the nation as well as the individual. Isaiah provides perhaps the best example of this using key words, quiet and confidence. Isaiah proclaims that faith, both political and religious, would save the people. In the Old Testament, an individual's relationship with God was grounded upon his faith in his covenant promises of grace and salvation. This concept is of the same essence as faith righteousness is in the New Testament. Habakkuk 2.4 illustrates this quite plainly. The just shall live by faith. 
This verse is greatly involved in Paul's doctrine of justification by faith. It's used three times in the New Testament. Okay? Um, can we turn off the heat? I, I'm, I'm, I'm about to get where I can't hardly breathe up here. Hallelujah. Glad I'm not going to hell. Anybody else glad you're not going to hell? Anybody want to go to hell? If anybody does, I'm going to tell you, stop listening to Led Zeppelin. All right? There is no stairway to heaven. Just saying. Out of hell. Huh? Just because they said it is. All right. In the New Testament, the Greek word, here we are. So we moved that down. That's, that's, that's kind of historical. So we understand that the usage of this when they began to write the New Covenant is already, is already kind of established. Faith means a reliance, a confidence, a trust in God. Okay, and there's other ways it's used, and we'll talk about that in the New Testament. But they say, so when they began to write, this word already has got an established religious meaning to it. Okay? God is the object of the faith. Amen. Folks, you've got to keep your confidence in God. Now here's what, listen, in the church world, in churches, in, in church relationships, understand, people are going, to, listen, not will, people are going to let you down. They are going to. That's a negative confession. That ain't, that's Bible, that's just fact. That's why you're taught to walk in love. That's why you're taught to forgive. That's why you're taught, you know, to take no account of evil. Why? Because they're going to do it. It's just going to happen. It's bobbleheaded. Somebody go get my bobblehead. I'll bobblehead myself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just bobblehead myself. Hallelujah. All right. So both the noun pistis and the verb pisteo <clears throat> have a wide range of usage in the New Testament. For example, the synoptic, the synoptic gospels, that's um, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, okay, frequently employ pistis to indicate trust in Jesus' ability and willingness to meet both physical and spiritual needs. In the epistles, Pisces regularly describes the life of faith wrought by the Spirit in the heart of the people. Uh, the believer can become strong in faith, the, um, grounded and established. He or she may stand fast in the faith, be full of faith, or be on the road to a deeper faith. At the same time, there exists the possibility of weakening in one's faith. Now, in this actual case, it means uh, Pisces can mean faithfulness. You can, be, you can get weak in your faithfulness. Yeah, we don't need to be weak in our faithfulness, do we? We need to be strong in our faithfulness. Actually, if you're faithful, you're not weak and you're not faithful less. You're faithful. Pisces may denote a whole range of Christian teaching about Christianity. In essence, the faith. Pisces can also denote a charismatic manifestation, charismata, given by God. Finally, Pisces is a principle. For example, faith stands over against the law. The different facets of the gem of faith become readily apparent when one examines the New Testament writings. Synoptic writers understood faith in terms of conviction that God could fulfill the promises given by the prophets. Since this fulfillment is accomplished in the Messiah, faith is to be centered in Jesus Christ, the manifestation of God's salvation plan. Faith involves trusting in the divine power of Jesus to perform miracles throughout his teaching. Jesus instructed him. Huh? Oh, hallelujah. Throughout his teaching, Jesus instructed the disciples to depend upon God. In this respect, faith contradicts fear. Faith is the good news of the gospel, is another major concern of the synoptic writers. To, so too is faith in Jesus as the Messiah. The title, The Believers, describes both Jews and converted Gentiles. Believers have faith in Jesus, is the Messiah, promised in the Old Testament scriptures. Such faith grows out of God's call and his word as it is received. And it results from the fact that God opens hearts. The faith, in essence, the Christian faith. In other words, we're, all the time we're, it refers to uh, the, they're walking in the faith. Well, that's not believing and receiving. That is a reference. The word that in that context means the, the embodiment of the religious and Christian teachings. It's the faith. <coughs> The, Christian, the, the faith, in essence, the Christian faith, is to be obeyed. Hence, the command that God's people should continue in the faith. Paul saw faith as a, a normative expression of the Christian. Unlike John, who in, in, employed the verb, pistio, 
exclusively, Paul primarily utilized the noun pistis. Like the other New Testament writers, Paul usually avoided giving any definition of the essence of faith. Instead, he presupposed that the object and essential qualities of faith are known. See, in other words, when he began to write and use it, he already thought, well, they're Jews, and they're writing, and those I'm writing to already understand the meaning of this word. It's been around for centuries. Okay? So he didn't spend time defining it. All right? Now, I know we will use uh, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things. And, and let me understand this. In the context of how that was being used, that's correct, but that's not the only thing. It's not, you know, the, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, faith in God is a trust in God. You have to take things within their context. Okay? Now, when you're believing and receiving, it is the evidence of things hoped for, the, I mean, the, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of not th things not seen. But take within the context of how they're written, and, you know, see, if we don't do that, and, when, and that, we also, us preachers have, been, have done a bad job. We haven't, we haven't given the whole narrative. We've given what we like to give, okay, of, of subject matter. There's more to the subject of faith than believing you receive. And that's what we're here for this morning for, because I believe if we can establish you in a trust and a reliance on God, the part of believing you receive will be easier. Does that make sense? It's easier to believe you receive when you are fully reliant and confident in the one that you are believing you're going to receive from. Hallelujah. Come on, iPad, cooperate. All right. Anybody know where I was? Nope. All right. Pa Paul primarily used the noun Pisces like the... Uh, like the other New Testament writers, Paul usually avoid giving any definitions of the essence of faith. Instead, he presupposed that the object and essential qualities of faith are known. For Paul, faith was that which justifies. To believe or to begin to believe are equal to being or becoming a Christian. The epistle to the Hebrews emphasizes faith's quality as the mark of God's people, even from ancient times. In that great portrait gallery of faith, gallery of faith chapter 11, the writer offers lengthy, Excuse me, a lengthy series on the old covenant models of faith. Now think about it now. You got people running around going, oh, the old, we don't, you know, one guy recently said this, I don't know how long ago, but somebody said this, you know, nationally. You know, if, uh, if the guys who put the canon together had just left out the Old Testament, we, we had no problem with, with the grace message. I'm thinking, my goodness, every time Paul quoted scripture, he caught, quoted the old covenant. This whole chapter 11, <clears throat> the, Hebrew, the Hebrew heroes of faith in chapter 11 came out of the Old Testament. The Bible in Hebrews even tells us that the things written about Israel were written for our example. And so we can learn. You can learn. Say, I can learn. From the example of faith lives in the Old Testament. There are things we can learn from them. So I'm glad they left the Old Testament in there. Hello? I don't, you know, it, didn't fit, it doesn't fit their narrative because there's so many scriptures that contradict their teaching that come out of the Old Covenant. If we just got rid of that, then they wouldn't have anything to contradict them. Well, I'll just stay with, the, with, with what's accepted as canon. All right, we'll stay with what's the Bible. We'll stay with that. <clears throat> when people start, listen, I, I've got to take a little side journey here real quick. When people come out and start disqualifying scripture and sections of scripture because they're contradictory, to their narrative, run. There was a whole group that came out about a year ago. They found a Bible that somebody translated that left 1 John 1, 9 completely out. Conveniently, it was a, it, and it became the hot Bible. See, it's not even the original. Now, careful. How many translations do we have of the Bible around the world? How many people have translated the Greek? How many scholars have translated for, for, you know, for, for uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? And all of a sudden, some new whippersnapper comes along and says, well, that's not in the original. You know? Run. Because 1 John 1, 9 is a big issue with their narrative. And so they found a Bible that doesn't have it in there. How convenient. Why don't we just start you know, taking all stuff out that doesn't align with what we want? You can't do that. Now, there are, <laughs> there are two sets of transcripts. One's called the majority text, one's called the minority text. The majority text is what the King James was founded and built on. The minority text was used primarily starting with the revised version in the late 1800s. And most modern translations have used the revised version, and almost, almost used the revised version as their, as their study tool to translate their newer versions. 
when you put the, the majority text versus the minority text against each other, there are huge amounts of passages left out in the minority and even reworded in ways that almost deny the deity of Jesus. When you read them and you see them, there's scriptures they're, 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 So be careful. Okay? Now, I know some people don't like the King James. They call it the political Bible, but I'm telling you, it's a very, very thorough translation. Okay? Very thorough. And it did use the majority text. And, uh, and we, don't, well, we don't have Greek manuscripts over yet. We've got translations that are older than the transcripts they have. We've got Latin transcripts that are older than, than the Greek transcripts we have. So you have to compare them because those Latins are translated from something. All right? So let's just, let's t when people start taking stuff out of the Bible and throwing it out and saying that's not here and that's not there, and they'll say every, major, every scholar says this. Wait a second now. Maybe every modern scholar, but you've got to remember that a lot of the modern scholars are, are, are atheistic or antichrist or, or uh, went, to sem went to the seminary school, I mean, cemetery school and not seminary. Okay? Went there with a lot of faith and came out dead. And they're being taught by people who, who teach against the Bible and try to undo it. So let's, let's, just, let's not run off, the, run off too quick and start throwing all sorts of Bible out just because it doesn't line up with what somebody wants. The Old Testament's there, and the Bible even tells us in the New Testament it's there for our example. All right? So let's stay with the Bible. A little, little weak amen at work. Amen? amen? Which is why I always, I always start with the King James. I may use other translations because they, they, they can bring light if they, if they word it in a way that just helps us. But, you know, I'm not going to throw out everything just because, you know, they don't like the way it's worded. Amen. Now, where was I? Anybody know? Yeah. Hebrews chapter 11, the great portrait gallery of, gallery of faith. The writer offers a lengthy series of the Old Testament models of faith. These saints believe God's promises in spite of the apparent hopelessness of their soul. Oh, praise God. See, we can learn from them. They, they were under, the Bible says about Abraham, under utterly hopeless circumstances he believed, or hopefully believed. You get to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, and you start looking at those guys, none of them had a really good scenario. And I'll dare to believe or dare to state that every one of them had one worse than what you're facing right now. Go read what they went through. Nobody's trying to cut you in half. Nobody's threatening to boil you in oil. Nobody's got stones getting ready to stone you to death right now. Come on now. I'm late on my house payment. And you're going to fall out with God? Come on now. I mean, go read, go read Hebrews 11 again. Get a little inspired. Amen? Somebody say Amen. My, my um, Facebook, my, my, my iPad just did some. There we go. We're back. We're back in business. Hallelujah. Glory. These saints believe God's promises in spite of the apparent hopelessness of their circumstances. Without seeing the realization of the promises, they lived and died believing that the promised Messiah would one day come. Think about it. <clears throat> These having died in faith, they without us could not inherit the promises. They died in faith. Man, we go two weeks and we quit, but people give up. Oh, I need two weeks. Ah, that faith stuff don't work. These people died in faith. Amen. Went in Abraham's bosom and had to wait hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of years on earth time for, for Jesus to walk across that gulf and declare the Messiah had come. But they died in faith, praise God. Are you here? Man, we get two weeks behind or something, or you know, not getting our faith answered right away, and oh my, oh my God, the world's falling apart. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. I'm quitting. I'm gonna go serve Muhammad because that Christian stuff don't work. Come on, church. We got to get a little more, a little more skin to us. Hallelujah. Tough skin. Lizard skin. Amen. I mean, we need to be tough. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We need to get where our faith doesn't waver. Praise God. That was a really good place for all of you to say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Uh, one of the great evangelists, I'm trying to remember if it was Finney or who it was, but had a lifelong friend. He had prayed for him every day for, you know, that he would get saved. He died. That guy was not saved. He got saved at his funeral. 
he died in faith and the guy got saved. <laughs> At his funeral. Hallelujah. Raymond Bible Church now stands on a knoll. And you've got to understand Oklahoma knolls are different than your knoll. It's paramount to an a, a anthill. Okay? And I'm not talking about a major anthill. I'm just talking about an anthill. You know. And that farmer will go out there on that land every day. I mean, not every day, but they go out there and, and pray and call on God to use that property to reach the nations. And that was 70 years before Raymond Bible Church was built. But the best they can figure from the family, talking with the family, and the family talking to them about what their grandfather used to do and that kind of stuff, that Raymond Bible Church now stands right on that little knoll where he would pray that God would use that land. He died in faith. See, faith is a spiritual force. It is not a natural force. Faith is not moved by time and the elements known as time. Faith is a spiritual, eternal thing, glory to God. And we can pray things out by the Spirit, glory to God. And we can get into faith about them, and those answers will come, glory to God. Not necessarily in your timing, but they will come. Hallelujah. Saints believe promises in spite of the apparent hopelessness of their circumstances. Without seeing the realization of the promises, they lived and died, believing that the promised Messiah one day would come. Faith characterized their lives. In other words, now listen, they had a confidence in their God. They put their trust in God. Glory to God. They, they might be said to have realized that without faith it's impossible to please God. Paul, I'm sorry, James in his letter complimented Paul's teaching on justification by faith. Whereas Paul, see, a lot of people always say, Paul and James were in disagreement. Paul said, with, you know, that faith by work, you know, that if you do faith by works, it's the law. James said faith without works, I mean, uh, is dead being alone. They were in disagreement. That's not, you, you don't, you're, not, you're not being a good Bible student. You listen to some bozo. Don't listen to bozos. I need to do a, a little, one of those little things like cable TV does. When you don't study your Bible, you listen to bozos. And when you listen to bozos... <laughs> <laughs> you have Pastor Ed doing that little you know, thing. Don't study your Bible and don't listen to bozos. You know. <coughs> no, you know, you know, I think we ended up with it. And, and, and when, you don't, when you don't listen to bozos, when you listen to bozos, you get in the air. When you get in the air, you do this. When da, 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 and then when you do all that, you're like Jim Jones. Don't be like Jim Jones. Study your Bible. All right. Just, that kind of came on the fly. All right, anyway. James, in his letter, complimented Paul's teachings on justification by faith. Whereas Paul tried to prevent someone from be basing, basing salvation upon works, James advised his readers that works must follow as the fruit of faith and as proof of salvation. He cautioned against a faith that rests upon an intellectual assent to the truth but lacks a life yielded and obedient to God. In conclusion, the New Testament speaks of the word of faith, the law of faith, the obedience of faith, the righteousness which is by faith, the life of faith, the walk in faith, the prayer offered in faith, the work produced by faith, the battle of faith, and the end of faith. Each, each of these always concur, occurs within the glorious framework of Christ's redemptive work. The basis of faith is the Word of God and His action in history. That's why we need the Old Testament. you got to see what God did. See, somebody wants to get rid of it because it doesn't work with their narrative. But God has it there so we can see and be able to put reliance, confidence, trust in him because throughout history he has demonstrated a faithfulness to do what he said he would do. His character is the same. God does not change simply because we have transitioned from one covenant to another. God is the same. Jesus Christ, remember the uh, um, Hebrews 13.8, I believe, or 1 Corinthians 13.8. Jesus Christ, Acts 13.8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday. Which is it? I'm, 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 I'm so befuddled now. Who? Hebrews 13.8. Thank you. I had it right the first time. All right. Jesus Christ, the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Well, what's God? God, I am the Lord, I change not. That is a characteristic of God. And so, <clears throat> by studying the history of God, what happens? We begin to see a pattern. God does what he said he's going to do. Amen. God always does what he said he's going to do. Every time God said he's going to do it, he did it. Amen. 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 And sometimes it wasn't good. Lot's wife was warned not to look back. 
And she looked back. Amen? She's now called Morton. Salt. Hallelujah. All right. In, okay. The basis of, of faith is the word of God and his action in history. Thus faith is, listen, thus faith is directed at God himself. Our confidence, listen, our confidence is in him. It's not in the fact you confessed it 4,000 times. If you remove God from your faith, you have no faith. You do have a human effort and a human work. Then you're counting on how many times you confessed it. You're counting on how hard you believed. You have to start. You have to start. You say, everybody say, I have to start. With a complete trust, reliance, and confidence in God. Abraham being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Where did that come from? He knew God. He'd watched God. He'd seen God. For 25 years, he watched God fulfill his promise to him. Now, Isaac didn't come in his timing because it went 87. He said, oh, you know, what are you going to do? Because I go child. See, he, he got, listen. Now, that's after Hagar had come to him. Remember, he said, he said uh, actually, he said, what are you going to do for me? seeing I go childless. And then he, uh, he said, oh, that uh, uh, Eleazar might live before thee. In other words, he wanted, he wanted his, the, the son of a house uh, servant to be his heir. God said, that's coming out of you. It's coming out of you. And then after that, Sarah comes to him just not long after. He goes, hey, look, I got a deal for you. Going with Hagar. And he said, okay. He, no arguments. We have no arguments in the Bible. Hagar could have been a good-looking woman. He thought, well, she said it's okay. Men, rule number one. If your wife says it's okay, it's not okay. <laughs> with God or with her? Hello? Come on, women. You know I'm talking right. She was just sulking, he, and he didn't realize it. Realize when they're sulking when they really mean it. Because after the baby's born, she's ready to kill the, 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 both of them. Despised in her eyes. All right? Now, Abraham should have known better, but he didn't. But then, you know, when, when God comes back at 99, he tries to offer Ishmael. And the Lord says, no, it's coming out of Sarah. It's coming from Sarah. And Abraham, believed. see, he kept, if God had been faithful all those years, prophets for him, do it all, delivering him. His word and learning from the, from the Old Testament, the history of, his, of God, learning from our experiences with God, we, we, we grow in our confidence, trust, and reliance in God. It makes it a whole lot easier to speak your faith. Let me say this. Some people come into a church, don't, have, don't know anything, come in and try to grab a hold of faith confession here and there, and go out and try to make it work, it doesn't work, and they, and they get upset because it didn't work. This, let me say, faith confessions are not magic formulas. They are not abracadabras. They are not little whim, uh, whimsical quotes that are going to magically make things happen. They are based in a relationship with the author of those words with whom you have great confidence and trust and reliance in. And until there is a great confidence, trust, and reliance, it's going to be very difficult to take those words and make them work in your life. Amen. It starts in relationship. And that relationship is our confidence and trust in him. Sometimes our work of the flesh is a confession. Well, I'll just speak this and it's going to, you know, hocus pocus it. Just got to start with confidence in God. I'm going to get church bobbleheads. So I can set them out in the seats and make them all vibrate so y'all at least do something. Hallelujah. The basis of faith is the word of God is actually the ministry. I mean, history. Thus faith is directed at God himself. This concerns not only the subjective dimension of faith, but the objective dimension as well. Perhaps even more so. God and Jesus Christ are 
the objects of faith, central to the life lived by faith. Jesus is rightly called the author and finisher or perfecter of our faith. Amen. Great faith comes from people who walk in a relationship with their great God. Ever-increasing faith comes from men and women who are having an intimate interaction of confidence, trust, and reliance upon the greatness of their God and in their God. Amen. Now, Karen came to church this morning. This is the first time with us. Now, you, be, you may think, because she looks like Sharon, she's been with us a hundred times, but she hasn't. And I might say, Karen, at church, I'm going to give you 50 bucks. And she might really hope I would. But she has no way to know if I really am. She might wish I would. She might think, you know, he's probably a good guy. I'm just kind of looking at my character. She kind of judges my character. He probably will. But she has no way of knowing for sure that I will. <coughs> Amen. Brother Bill's been with us for a long time. So 25 years, Brother Bill's been with us. 26 years, going to 26. If I tell Brother Bill in the service I'm giving him 50 bucks, he's in the, he's in the foyer with his hand out. Is that not right? Amen. Because he knows me. He knows if I say I'm going to do it, we're going to do it. All right? I'm, I'm going to do it. If I, tell you, if I promise you in a personal issue that I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you $50, Brother Bill. Karen, I hope I am. She doesn't know. How is she going to know? By being around me and, and, and with me long enough and having interaction with me enough that she comes to know my character over time that I will do that and so she can then trust. This, but I'm not doing $50 this morning because I don't have $50 in my wallet. So <laughs> just that was an example. It wasn't really real. So sorry. Next time maybe. We'll just see. Okay. She sounds like Sharon. Voice sounds the same. And she forgave me, praise the Lord. All right. So tonight we're going to have to come back because I can't finish. I can't go. I'm not, you know, I gave you the one scripture. Tonight we're going to come back and we're going to go through different scriptures, most of them from the Old Testament. You know, Proverbs is a good place to study. Well, that's the Old Testament. Wisdom is wisdom. God gave Solomon, God, Solomon wrote most of the, not all of it, but most of the Proverbs. And there's never been a man wiser than him since him. God gave him supernatural wisdom. So is it only wisdom for the, the age prior to this? No. It's still wisdom. And it's still godly wisdom. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Now I am going to cover that one right now real quick. Because <clears throat> I looked up acknowledge. In all your ways consider And give and, and make reference to him. In other words, and see here, this will keep this is one of those things that keep you out of sin. Trust in him, put your confidence, reliance in him with all your heart, in all your ways, consider him. Are your actions going to be pleasing to him? Amen. And he shall direct your paths. What do you, when you begin to look at God and say, is this going to honor the Lord, what I'm doing? Because I'm taking into consideration him who I have my confidence, trust, and reliance upon. And now I'm going to, all the ways that I act, I'm going to take into consideration how they reflect towards him and about him in my life. That'll change, that'll change a lot. Amen? Now we come back to it and go, and he'll direct my paths. In other words, if I'm going to, if I'm going to honor him and say, now, Lord, I'm going, to, I'm going to consider you in this action, now he's going to direct my paths. What's he going to do? If it's not pleasing to him, he's going to direct you away from it. If it doesn't honor him, he'll direct you away from it. And then you're going to have, con don't listen to the people who tell you it doesn't matter to God. It does matter to God. Things matter to God. That's why he took time to have them written down. Because they matter to him. Amen. 
And so if we'll be yielded to him, if we're putting all of our confidence, trust, and reliance in him, and then we acknowledge him and consider him and, put, and reflect upon these things in light of him, and then he's going to direct my path, then I'm going to have a confidence that when he directs my path away from something, it's because it's not good for me or not good for, for my relationship with him, and he's going to direct me into a place that is good for that. And I'll honor him in that place. And I'll avoid problems in the other. Amen. Amen. Paul wrote to the church in Romans and said that if you yield your members as servants of unrighteousness, amen, you, you know, he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. What's that mean? Well, corruption isn't good. I don't, I don't think corruption is good. I mean, you maybe if you're the Godfather, you think it's good, but it's not good. Even if you're the Godfather, it's still not good. All right? Corruption is bad. It's, it, it, things are corrupted. How many of you have ever had a corrupted hard drive? No, oh, am I the only one in this, this building that's had a corrupted hard drive? Okay. Was it good? Corrupted data in a database. Not good. Okay? Corrupted flesh is not good. And so God's telling us, put your trust, your reliance, your confidence in me. And in everything you do, take me into consideration. And when you do, I'll direct your paths. Hallelujah. Now, we know this from the 23rd Psalm. He leads us by still waters. Amen. He leads us in the green pastures. And we have surely goodness and mercy. Our three angels following us all the days of our life. That's a joke. And three angels, surely, goodness, and mercy. All right. Surely is the redhead. All right. Hallelujah. Amen. All the days of our life, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord. So when I have a confidence and a trust, and we're going to, we've got a lot more scripture we'll cover tonight, reliance and confidence and trust in him, and I consider him in everything I do, what am I doing? I said, okay, now I'm, I'm going to back off this thing. I'm not going to push it my way. I'm going to trust you. You're going to lead me. And then we got the 23rd Psalm. And we know we're going by still waters. We're going by to the green pastures. And even if we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear any evil because he's with us. His rod and his staff comforts us. Amen? What's that? See, when you're led by the Lord, we walk in peace. We walk in tranquility. We walk in the blessing. Amen. I think some things are, well, I just know some doctrines are, are brought by devils to keep people out of the blessing of the Lord by offering them something that, that's, that the flesh appeases the flesh when all the while it's not helping your spirit at all. And God wants you to learn to put all your trust and confidence in him and let him lead and guide you as you consider him in all your ways. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Let's stand up. Father, we thank you for the service. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Amen. Thank you that Jesus is our Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you that you're going to lead us and guide us. Thank you, Lord, that we're going to have an understanding that our faith confessions will work when we put our trust and confidence in you and you alone. Amen. Hallelujah. Every head bow, eye closed. If you're here this morning and Jesus Christ is not your Lord, you're not born again, you don't have the life of God on the inside of you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you today. Hallelujah. Anybody here? Amen. Anybody here? You're backslidden. Got to think about it. I haven't been considering my ways. I haven't, I haven't been acknowledging him in all my ways. I haven't been putting my trust in him. I've been putting my trust in my flesh and doing what I want to do. Anybody here that you, you know, you're, you're there, you want to get right with God? One more off, if you're here this morning, you're not baptized with the Holy Ghost. We mean exactly what Acts 2, 4 says. They were all filled with the Spirit, began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Anybody not baptized in the Holy Ghost? All right, look up at me. I accept your testimony. I believe you're all saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. If I was Pentecostal, I would say saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's what I'm what we used to say in Pentecostal. I thank like, like the Lord. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. Hallelujah. Amen. How many are holding true to the end? Amen. How many are saved? Filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, Jesus was made unto you your sanctification when you got saved. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen.
And so he, he works in you. Amen. The, Spirit, the Holy Spirit of fire works in you. Amen. Gets any of that junk out. He may, you know, if you've got junk, he'll get rid of it. But you've got to let him. You've got to acknowledge. Oh, that's junk, Lord. Get it. <laughs> you've got to take the deadbolt off of the door. You don't want him in that room. Amen. Anybody got rooms like that? You don't, talk, don't raise your hand. Anybody got rooms like that in your spiritual life? You know, God goes to that door, you got a dead bolt, you got padlocks, you got dead bolts, you got, I mean, arm bars, all kinds of stuff. You ain't getting in that room. He's getting in that room eventually. If he has to burn the house down. That's, that's a joke. I'm just teasing that. Hallelujah. 